For many, the greatest appeal of Star Wars is its many wonderfully designed ships. From the lithe and sleek Delta-class light interceptor to the 19-kilometer-long Executor-class Star Dreadnought, the starships of this galaxy capture the wonder and excitement of all of us who love machines and speed. But because of the nature of Star Wars' narrative, we oftentimes only focus on how fast these ships can go and how many turbo laser emplacements they can fit on their surface. But the reality is all of these ships, both large and small, need fuel to stay alive. Without it, they can no longer move, they'll have no power for heat or life support, and they'll just become empty husks, derelicts for scrappers to break up. Like in our world, energy is also the driving force behind all economic development, transportation, and industrial production in the Star Wars galaxy. Although it's rarely highlighted in the main story, behind every political agenda and trade policy, behind every war that erupts in the galaxy, fuel for ships and factories play a huge role in decision making. In Star Wars, fuel comes in many different forms and names. You had good old fashioned crude oil pumped out of the depths of Kaishik, good for combustion and heat. You had Cloud Zone 36 found in remote asteroid belts, useful for powering hyperdrives. There is also Tabana gas from Bespin for blasters and turbolasers. Volatile Rhydonium from Abafar, a fuel for starship thrusters, and the even more dangerous starship fuel Coaxium from the mines of Kessel. Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. In Star Wars, the list of different types of fuel can go on and on and on. But today I want to focus on one planet, Naboo, and on one fuel source, Plasma, and how the discovery of this one energy source would forever change this planet and the lives of everyone who lived on it. This is a cautionary tale about vulnerable and undiversified economies, predatory corporations, and how rich energy deposits can be both a curse and also a treasure all at the same time. Idyllic was the perfect description for Naboo. It was a relatively small temperate planet, rich in wildlife, and blessed with extremely fertile soil. Large majestic mountain ranges cut swaths across the planet, rolling hills and splendid waterfalls nestled right alongside them fed directly into the river and lake countries, which themselves were bordered by mysterious swamplands. The planet was in harmony and balanced. Life was good. Naboo was located in the mid-rim, which is actually a misleading label for this region of the galaxy. If you take a look at the galactic map, the mid-rim is on the outer edges of the civilized parts of the galaxy, just bordering the chaotic outer rim. With the way the Galactic Republic worked, the closer you were to Coruscant, the more political power and therefore economic support and trade connections your planet had. On the flip side, there are some advantages to being in such a remote part of the galaxy. Naboo, for instance, had a very sparse population, which meant that resources were plentiful and available for everyone. There are only 1.25 billion humans living on the planet, along with 3.25 billion Gungans, who lived mostly in the swamp areas and in underwater cities. The humans had first landed on the planet around 4000 BBY, and by 3900 BBY the first permanent settlements were being established by Grismalt refugees looking to escape a brutal civil war. The first human settlers who arrived on the planet were quite ragged and poor. They didn't really have that much money or special equipment to survey the planet for raw resources and minerals, and so they developed a very plain agrarian society and relied on subsistence farming for quite some time. And so it took quite a while for stable hyperspace routes to be established in the region. Nibu actually didn't even have a large freight capable starport until like a hundred years before the Clone Wars. This lack of development on the planet combined with a lack of interest by major corporations and foreign entities meant that Nibu was actually allowed to grow at its own pace. By the time of the High Republic era, the golden age for the Republic, Nibu had become an extremely comfortable planet to live on. It wasn't rich, but life was good and easy. The primary exports of the planet were grains, milliflower, wine, and art and cultural items. The 
Despite making up the majority of the planet's population, very little was known about the Gungans. The Naboo and the wider galaxy had no idea how many Gungans lived on the planet and just how advanced they actually were. Deep below the surface, they had built and grown massive underwater cities like Otagunga, using bubble wart extract and plasma. And beneath those cities, you had massive tunnels that ran across the entire planet. You see, unlike other terrestrial planets, Naboo had a molten outer core, which sort of bubbled up and carved many tunnels all throughout the crust of the planet. The Gungans would use these tunnels to cut down on the time it took to travel to the other side of Naboo. The plasma also created rich mineral deposits which helped seed all sorts of vegetation and terrifying megafauna throughout the various oceans. The plasma was the key to all Gungan technology. They would harness its energy for propulsion of its underwater vehicles. They would use it to create shield generators which could protect their armies from projectiles and also keep the water at bay in their aquatic cities. The plasma could also be used as an explosive weapon. Compared to other energy sources, this plasma was also extremely clean and efficient. This was Naboo's greatest secret and very few off-worlders knew about it. But somewhere around 70 years before the Battle of Yabin, a Gosum mining company known as Subtex Corporation was able to survey the planet and find out about the secret. Those same mining executives had orchestrated the murder of their business partner, a famous Bith starship designer known as Rugus Gnome, whose secret identity was Darth Tenebris. Tenebris was a Sith Lord, and his apprentice Darth Plagueis would survive him and seek revenge on Subtex mining. He would gain access to the information about Naboo's plasma reserves as a result. Darth Flakos was easily one of the most powerful individuals in the entire galaxy, but not many people had actually heard of him before. But through his lobbying company, Damas Holdings, Plagueis controlled massive amounts of wealth and had connections to almost every major corporation and political faction in the galaxy. He used his money and political influence to slowly sow chaos all across the galaxy. The idea was to destabilize the Republic and start a massive civil war. And Naboo was just one of the small pieces in his larger plan to destroy the Republic and their Jedi Guardians. In 65 BBY, Naboo was on the verge of great change. An impending election would decide the future of the planet, and whether the newly found plasma reserves would be exploited. Now, there were two main factions involved in this political process. One was the conservative faction. They were more isolationist in their mindset, and they wanted a domestic mining corporation to take over this entire operation. Unfortunately, that was pretty much non-existent on Naboo. They didn't have any companies like this at all. Plasma extraction from the mantle layer was extremely tricky, as was refining plasma into a fuel source. And then there was the issue of Naboo's lack of infrastructure. They had no spaceport that was really large enough to start exporting massive amounts of fuel to other star systems. And so Naboo lacked the capital, infrastructure, and know-how to properly carry out such an operation. And even if they were able to develop something domestically, this would have been a much smaller operation than some larger galaxy-wide mining corporation could have created, and therefore, the cost of this fuel would just not have been very competitive on the larger markets. So what Naboo really needed to do was to quickly scale up the production from the beginning to lower its costs, and in order to do that, it had to seek outside investment. This is where Bon Topolo comes in. He is a part of the more pro-business political faction, and he already has some off-world endorsements from Damas Holdings and also the Trade Federation. The latter corporation would be able to quickly build up the infrastructure for a plasma refining operation, and at the same time build a gigantic new spaceport to allow Naboo to quickly begin shipping energy off-world. This is realistically the best option for Naboo should they choose the path of becoming an energy exporter. This was the single biggest issue in the upcoming Naboo election, and most of the local population had developed their own uh, thoughts on this political matter. For instance, Sheev Palpatine was really pro-opening up Naboo to foreign investment, whereas his father, Kinsinga Palpatine, supported the traditionalist. One of the reasons why Sheev Palpatine supported this project was because he had already met Darth Plagueis and was being mentored by him.
So here's the biggest problem with plasma extraction or any kind of large energy extraction project, especially on a very poor and small world that lacks specialist infrastructure and corporations to do things domestically. You're immediately going to have to rely on foreign entities like the Trade Federation to come in and set up everything for you. These companies will overnight become in charge of one of the largest sources of revenue for your planet. And unlike other industries like high tech or manufacturing, the energy business actually employs relatively few people. And these are highly trained and specialized individuals. Uh, you can't just train these people from your general population overnight. You need to actually develop a training pipeline. So most likely the Trade Federation will bring in experts from their own planet. And so your locals won't be lifted out of poverty with these new high paying jobs. At best, they'll work in some kind of service industry that um, maybe supports these new workers. Maybe they'll be, you know, taxi cab drivers or, you know, they'll work in a hotel and they'll see a small raise in pay, but they won't become employed because of these type of projects. Now, obviously you can have the right treaties and deals in place that can protect a planet like Naboo from getting ripped off by corporations like the Trade Federation, but ultimately the only thing the government gets from deals like this is money and not necessarily an industry that can uplift the general populace out of poverty. So instead of this money going into people's pockets through jobs, the government will have to redistribute it somehow through services like, uh, I don't know, education, healthcare, and other things like that, which isn't a perfect way to do things. Now, in more corrupt planets, when all the wealth is flowing from energy companies directly into the coffers of the government, you can expect officials to skim a little off the top for themselves or use that money for their own personal needs or to create a security force to make sure that they can maintain their corrupt power and continue getting money from these energy companies. Now, Naboo didn't necessarily have a corruption problem, but it did have a money issue, and the deal from the Trade Federation and Damas Holdings was too tempting. And so Bontopolo would win the election, and he would essentially become the puppet of Darth Plagueis. Naboo would be sold to the Sith. The Trade Federation delivered on all of its promises. It built all of the infrastructure it needed to and began exporting plasma from the planet. But because of its rarity, the Trade Federation was actually able to sell this fuel for 20 times the amount they paid Naboo. And at this point, it was already too late for Naboo to pull out of the deal. And so having an energy industry boom while the rest of your economy is completely unprepared and you also lack the capability of protecting your planet, it's like walking around in a bad neighborhood with a giant diamond studded necklace. It will just attract all of the wrong individuals. You're gonna attract large corporations and foreign entities who will try to exploit and cheat you out of all of your riches. And should you try to resist by, let's say, developing your own domestic industry to extract those resources, those larger powers will use their existing control of the market to push you out, or maybe they'll just use a military force, as was the case in Star Wars. Eventually, Naboo would just be blockaded and then invaded by the Trade Federation. This was supposedly in response to the Republic's repeal of the Free Trade Zone, but the real reason the Trade Federation wanted the system was because of the energy deposits buried deep beneath its earth. So as you can see, large energy deposits can be a huge curse uh, on your planet if your economy and other government structures are not prepared for a massive inflow of new capital. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please do subscribe down below and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan and my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.